What time is it? It's Word at Noon time, where we get to take a few minutes here at the middle of the day and just read some scripture, maybe think about what it says, and just make some time for God. What a great day it is. Start with some prayer. God, thanks. May we take some time in our busy day to seek you and hear your word. Hopefully we understand it today. If not, let us get to know you as you teach us what it means. For it's in the beautiful name of Christ we pray. Amen. So, we've got a couple scriptures today, and I just want to start. Let's read them. Let's see what they say. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Some of it's tricky. Some of it's not. Uh, some of it, I'm even still trying to figure out what it means. But let's be intentional about seeing what God's book says. First one, we're going to start in Psalm 126. It's a song of ascents, and some of these were these psalms, or sometimes even a song, that the Jews would sing in times of ceremony or when they would go up uh, to the temple, usually for different celebrations like Passover. As they would walk, they would sing these songs that had thanksgiving, but also... Um, please, uh, request. So, you know, thank you, God, for what you've given, but I'm still praying for other things as well as they would go and think of the Lord on their way to the temple, even for Passover, the day where they've consecrated this lamb and it's day of sacrifice, of atonement, a high holy day where God and the people could come together and be close. And so this is what Psalm 26 says. It's a song of ascent, it says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And then it was said, even among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. But restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams of the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. I like this psalm because it's, it's kind of two-toned. We start with this uh, thanksgiving. Man, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. some th This is kind of a loose thing in Hebrew. It could say when the Lord... Uh, restored and brought the captives back to Zion or when the Lord restored uh, to health those of Zion. But it's this idea of the Lord has brought life back to Zion. And the people who were exiled and who have come back, they are like those who dreamed, those who said, man, could you imagine if this happened? And when they came back, their mouths were filled with laughter and Tongues with songs of joy. Have you ever had something come true that you couldn't dream of it happening? Or maybe it was only something in your dreams and now it's a reality. That joy springing up, that uh, welling, sometimes physical, like you just have to dance or do an exclamation, give a shout of joy. This is what they're feeling. They are back in their homeland, back in the place the Lord had made for them. And even the nations, even the people who aren't, you know, Jews, who aren't those people that the Lord has specifically chosen, even the other nations and peoples are like, wow, the Lord of Israel has done great things for them. Everyone recognizes how great the Lord's restoration was. But then it switches because it's not fully finished yet. Like, great, they're back in Zion, but the world isn't perfect yet. There are still things that need to be done. Fortunes that are still lost, injustices still there. Things still need restoration and the Lord's provision. So even though they're saying, he has done great things for us, he has, and we are filled with joy, they're still praying, Lord, restore our fortunes or the captives, or bring health, bring back those, restore our fortunes, like 
the streams of the Negev, those rivers that used to run in the desert, that flowed. Make us again like that. And it says, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. I'm not exactly sure what that means. And scholars debate differently, what does this verse mean? Um, and it's hard to get a precise thing, but there is a clear message here. It says, those who sow with tears of joy will reap with songs of joy. Sowing seed, which is when you go out to plant and uh, farm, you would sow the seed, you would plant, you would do the work so you can plant the seed so that it would then grow and you'd harvest. There was nothing sad in the action of going out and planting. There was nothing innately sad or depressive about that work. The thing is, in this case, where they're looking at stuff needs to be done, it's looking that there is work still to be done. And even though things aren't right and there is suffering, we go into the field ready to sow and we bring our tears, we bring our hurts, we bring our circumstances, we bring the joys of what has been restored and we bring the longing for it still to be completed. And we go into the fields and we sow with our tears, but the Lord promises, I will make a way and we will see the harvest with songs of joy. Just like they're restored back to Zion from the exile that they never thought they'd come back. They're with joy, but there is still work to be done. And it says, we will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves, sheaves meaning the harvest of wheat with them. There is the promise that the Lord will provide. There is the promise that he will restore. There is the promise that the Lord will do what he has promised to do. And that is not leave or forsake you. That is not allow you to live in suffering, but that one day he will come through. Whether that's today, whether that's the day we see him face to face, the Lord makes good on his word. And so we can take refuge that the fact the Lord is true and that he will restore us. But we can also find solace in the fact that we can be glad and thank him for what he's given and be thankful, yet still cry, Lord, continue to restore what is not yet perfect. And so the next scripture we've got, it's from Exodus, like way back in the front of the Bible. Exodus 12, 21 to 27. This is actually the story of Passover. Like I said, we had the Song of the Ascents, one of the praises and prayers that the Jews would say as they would go to the temple remembering Passover. Now we're going to look at actual Passover, and what this was about starts in verse 21 of chapter 12. It says, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once, select animals for your family, and slaughter, for the, pa and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put, it, put some of the blood on top of both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on top of the sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. And when you enter that, the Lord will give you as he promised. Observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed and worshipped. Here is Moses. He's just, they're in the midst of Egypt. Egypt is uh, very much a dictatorship and oppressing the Jews. 
uh, the Lord has told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, you're taking the Jews, my people, out. Um, Pharaoh keeps combating. And finally, this is the last kind of straw before Pharaoh lets the Egyptians, the Jewish people go. And you can read the rest of the story. But this is Passover. This is a point and a celebration and a festival and a tradition, an ordinance that the Jews celebrate every single year. And it signifies that the Lord not only made a way, but provided a sacrifice, but one that would give life. And it was a day where the Lord saved the Jewish people. And so in it, uh, the Lord has just told Moses, this is what you're going to do. You guys are going to um, slaughter the Passover lamb and buy its blood on the door frame. That's how I will know you are my people. When I am going through, I will pass over. That's why we call it Passover. Pass over your house and you will have life. Destruction will not come to you. And so as that would happen, uh, the people would do as was promised. And if you read the story, um, angel of destruction, some people say the angel of death, but the spirit comes through and the Egyptians lose their firstborn son. Um, and anyone who didn't put the blood on the frame would. But those who did put the blood, the Lord spared those children, gave them blessings, passed over. And so here... Moses says, this will be a ceremony to you. You'll do this year after year after year as a tradition to remember what the Lord has done. The Jews still do it today. But going back to that moment, that night when the Jewish people put the blood on the doorframe for the first time and the spirit passed over and they got to hold their firstborn child, do you think when that child grew up and said, what was this for? Do you think that father or that mother didn't look at the child with tears in their eyes, knowing it was for them? And to then tell the child of how good the Lord was and how the Lord made a way and how the Lord spared and provided blessing while that parent is looking at the blessing. And so Passover became this tradition, but that first one, to see the Lord provided and to tell your child of how the Lord provided. And that was Passover. And today we see it as this covenant that the Lord did with his people. He made a way for his people, redemption, and he bought them out and brought them out of Egypt. And that's where they found an exodus just like this, where they come out of Egypt was because the Lord made a way through sacrifice and blood so that blessings could be. Now, our last uh, scripture is actually from John. So we talked about uh, the song of the ascents. The people would go for Passover, usually singing, but also asking the Lord. Then we talked about Passover, this blessing of the Jews crying out, saying, Lord, redeem us, bring us out, bring us to freedom, and the Lord does, and there's still work to do. Now we come into John, and it's John 11, verse 45. Jesus has just healed Lazarus. Um, and it's a little time after this, or it's, he's just healed Lazarus. Lazarus is up and walking, right? They're removing the grave clothes. Everyone's going to party. And now start the scene. It says, therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. Jesus just raised Lazarus. Everyone's coming to talk and see what happened. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told the Pharisees what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. This was part of the council, these holy people. And he said, what are we accomplishing? 
they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. But if we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, he spoke up. He says, you know nothing at all. Don't you realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation would then perish? He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered people of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to live to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Passover again, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover, kept looking for Jesus, watching, waiting. And as they stood in the temple courts asking one another, what do you think? He's coming to the festival. Or I guess he's not coming to the festival after all. But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. There's a lot going on here. And again, Jesus is doing all these miracles. He does the miracle that would actually that actually brought life to somebody that would bring him his death, a life for a life. And what happens is Jesus is doing all these signs and miracles and the Jewish people and the nation is getting all, uh, they're believing in him. They're kind of wondering if he's gonna be this leader to take down Rome. And some of these Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they're scared because they don't want Rome to say, the Jews are causing a lot of trouble. We're gonna go in and take them out. Kind of like the Egyptians did. Or they were scared that Jesus was causing this riot, this uh, trouble. It, it was disturbing the peace of Rome. And so they're going, hey, we gotta do something about this, right? This guy's doing all these signs and miracles. We don't deny that. But he's rallying the people in a way that Rome would think is a, a rebellion. And so they say, we, we got to kill him. We got to save our nation at least. And then Caiaphas says one of the lines that was so prophetic. He says, wouldn't it be better that one man die for the nation? One man would die for his people, then the whole nation perish. And J John gives little commentary saying, right? He's prophesying that Jesus would die for the people. And, and not just like for the nation in political stances, but for salvation. Jesus would bring life, and not just for the Jewish people, but the scattered people all over. That's me and you. Jesus would die to bring life. Jesus... And this is happening at Passover. When we fast forward a little bit, Jesus will die at Passover. And so here it is. We saw Passover was God providing so that life could abound. There could be freedom from captivity. The captives could be restored, like the psalmist says. And here is Jesus, the sacrificial lamb who would die so that life would be brought to me and you. Like I said, who wouldn't in the first Passover look at their child, their firstborn, with tears in their eyes and say, this was for you. And God kind of flips it around. He looks at his first and only born who was sacrificed and looks at us and says, this was for you. And Jesus did it so willingly. And we will see him one day, him and the Father, just like the psalmist said, with joy and singing and gladness that can't be contained as we see him face to face. 
with life everlasting. That's the Passover that we get to celebrate. So let's pray. Father, thanks. You are a man with a plan that we could never have imagined. What else can we say but thanks? It's in the beautiful name of Christ that we pray. Amen.